rebel force has penetrated the shield and landed on Endor. This is where the fun begins. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. This is Rebel Force Radio. Your source for the Force. Star Wars news and commentary. With Jason Swank and Jimmy Mack. I've seen Star Wars 500 times. Star Wars number one. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I suggest we use it. Now it's time for Rebel Force Radio. We would be honored if you would join us. Darn right, it's that time for Rebel Force Radio. Welcome back, everyone. Had a fun show for you this week. By the way, if you're keeping track, we are just two months and two weeks away from the big premiere of the Ahsoka series. That's right, we've got a an official release date. Set to debut Wednesday, August 23rd. We've got a whole slew of Ahsoka news for you. Of course, that big Empire Magazine cover story just keeps dripping and dripping more stuff out. You know, that's what they they want you to run to the newsstand and pick it up the day that it comes out. And I was checking today. I was like, oh, it comes out tomorrow because you don't always, especially before it hits newsstands, get all of the uh, articles, you know, at, at, at one time, and it's not always the full article. So it kind of, you know, they know what they're doing. They're just giving you enough to get you excited and interested, and then they want you to go and buy the uh, buy the floppy copy on the newsstand, which I definitely will be doing that because uh, this is this is going to be a really really fascinating show to watch, not just as a fan, but to analyze because there is. This is, I think, a pretty risky venture for Lucasfilm, Dave Filoni, the Star Wars brand, because they're banking on a character that, and we'll talk about it, Dave Filoni talks about in this Empire article, is known to not the whole universe of Star Wars fans out there. So it's very, very interesting to have it be the titular character in a big series like that. And we'll be breaking that all down for you this week. Plus, more Mark Hamill. We can't get enough Mark Hamill. He was on CBS Sunday morning. I don't know if you watch that show. It's very highbrow. They cover things like classical music and Broadway and the fine arts and uh, Mark Hamill, apparently. You know, it's got the little trumpets that play at the beginning of it. Uh, Let you know you're watching something very fancy. And I know someone who's very fancy, always fancy, and that's, of course, my good friend and yours from Chicago, Jimmy Mack. Hey, Jason. Hey, Star Wars fans. You said titular. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no highbrow here. No no (laughs) classical music. Yeah, no trumpets playing. uh, (laughs) No, 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 no. (laughs) We'll take you down a notch, CBS. But uh, we're happy to be back. It was an action-packed weekend for me as we had a big RFR hangout on Friday night at the Galloping Ghost Arcade, the world-famous Galloping Ghost Arcade on Ogden Avenue in the uh, in Brookfield in the Chicago area. We had a ton of RFR uh, listeners come out, hang out for a night of gaming and cocktails uh, for RFR VIP guest of honor, Joe Dallas. There he is. There's Joe Dallas with the John Marcoux lurking over his shoulder. And uh, Tyler Page, the the eye and half of his hat there, uh, is in the forefront. But I don't so see the beard. A- I, I can't vouch that it's him. I need the beard. <laughs> That's Tyler. Yeah. That's Tyler. So we were, you know, all night. We are playing games at the Ghost, headed over to Imperial Oak Brewery for some... Uh, uh, beer and pizza and uh, laughs aplenty, shots of Malort. And Malort is uh, this poison they serve here in Chicago that I can only say is a, kind of a, a citrusy uh, Lysol-flavored gasoline that uh, we <laughs> joke and, and we make visitors drink it uh, just as a way of uh, trolling them. And uh, there's Joe Dallas. He's uh, hard at work at the Cubert machine. Uh, there was a big Cubert tournament, myself against Joe. And um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. There I am grinding away at the Cubert machine as well. So having a lot of fun at the world famous Galloping Ghost. It was a blast. Uh, we met a lot of uh, RFR listeners. Erin uh, was there. She gave me this really cool Baby Yoda painting she made. 
which is it was like watercolor on wood. It's fantastic. Meanwhile, we're looking at tattoos. Whose tattoos are we looking at here? Uh, that's Rob O from Chicago, another mm. great RFR VIP who's hosted many episodes of RFR Q&A with me. Yeah, we had a great turnout, great time. We had a couple of the Babu freaks there, Tyler Page and Barry Harmon. Of course, uh, there's Joe enjoying breakfast. There's Billy oh. enjoying the Lort. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, all kind of photos uh, at RFR on Patreon. Uh, Joe Dallas uh, dragged me out for uh, gourmet cupcakes when we were uh, trekking through downtown Chicago. We uh, went to... Uh, gourmet so, cupcakes? Uh, yeah, we went to had gourmet cupcakes right after uh, having greasy burgers at the world-famous Billy Goat. And we walked all the way to the end of Navy Pier. And then we had to stop in the Hard Rock because Joe collects shot glasses from the Hard Rock Hotel uh, wherever he goes. Mm. Uh, and so Hard Rock Chicago is on the list. There's Joe doing some green screen work at Joliet Star Wars Day. So we had a blast at Joliet Star Wars Day, too. And that's a, a big presentation. Uh, about 10,000 Star Wars fans descend on downtown Joliet. 10,000? Uh, really? It's, it's it's amazing. It just gets bigger That's and bigger. That's more than uh, ICCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCCC
Patreon.com slash Rebel Force Radio. We'll see you there. Patreon.com slash Rebel Force Radio. And we'll see you at the next RFR Summertime Hangout. This one, wow, what a blast we had. Man, it was just a perfect week. And there was only one thing that really kind of shook up my weekend a little bit was I got news that an old friend of mine who everyone knows, Danny Partridge, Danny Bonaducci from the Partridge family, I worked with him for several years in Chicago radio, and we were pals outside of work as well. And we've had many adventures together. And uh, Danny had to go under the knife to get brain surgery earlier this week on Monday. Well, the good news is the surgery is very serious, but it went as perfectly as can go. And they say Danny is going to recover. So he, he was having some really serious health issues. Uh, I was nervous. So uh, as I was going on my adventures with Joe Dallas over the weekend, I was texting a lot with Danny, uh, just, uh, you know, wishing him luck and everything. And he went into it in really amazing spirits. And uh, he was, <laughs> he said, as I was talking to him, he's just flipping around TV and he landed on an Elvis movie. And all of a sudden he popped up on the screen as a kid talking to Elvis in the movie. <laughs> hey, seven years me. old. There he is. Who's that kid <laughs> with Elvis? Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> he said, wow. I, I, I'm watching TV. And I'm in a very old movie that popped up. It's Trouble with Girls starring Elvis. I knew I was in an Elvis movie, but I forgot it was this one. Sure enough, I popped up and had a couple lines in it. I think I was seven. I was like, are you crazy? <laughs> He's in an Elvis movie. You're like, oh, yeah, 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 whatever. Just all part of growing up, you know, and that's how it was for Danny. And so the reason I bring him up is he was uh, once on RFR before, and uh, he's a lot of fun. He's a really just a great, fun guy. I wanted to have him on Rebel Force Radio because, as you know, how we do things around here. If, if, there's, uh, if, if we know that somebody is a big Star Wars fan. Or How's it going, honey? Here, I got it right here. This is The Trouble Wait, what's with this? Girls. This is The Trouble with Girls with Elvis. Where's Bonaducci? He, he was just... Uh, there he is. Oh, my God. <laughs> was he like a one-man band? Yeah, yeah. He's, he's like got a little drums. rascals kind of vibe going on. Yeah, there he is. Oh, yeah. Very little rascals. But <laughs> oh, he's really young in this Yeah. Movie. Yeah. There's Elvis with Mary Tyler Moore. Uh, I don't that's think incredible. that's Mary Tyler Moore. I don't know who that is. Oh, that's Mary Tyler Moore, dude. Isn't it? No. No. Oh, maybe it's not sure. But yeah, that's fantastic. Wow. I mean, how many people can say that they were in a movie with Elvis? I mean, that must be a real trip to be an actor that had had done so much at a young age. And, you know, with age, you kind of forget things. And so you're flipping around the mm -hmm. dial and you see yourself. That must be absolutely bananas. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Danny, of course, you know, as, as I said, we uh, here at Rebel Force Radio, we'll, we'll look for any excuse to talk to a big Star Wars fan or someone who has interesting Star Wars stories or behind-the-scenes tales to tell, even if they're not connected to Star Wars at all. I mean, just look at the last few weeks. Todd Stashwick from Picard, uh, Jeff Yorks from Muppets Mayhem. Uh, <laughs> their only connection is just they're massive Star Wars fans. Now, Danny, a massive Star Wars fan, not so much. But he did work with Mark Hamill a number of times in his career, most notably in the film Corvette Summer, which a lot of Star Wars fans from my generation really, we really liked that movie because it was Mark's first big movie after Star Wars. And so we kind of ate that up. It was almost like seeing Luke. Uh, <laughs> Luke was finally the cool guy. Well, uh, he's, he's still he's, that's he's still Mark, thing. but I mean, he, he's there are so many connections between Luke Skywalker <laughs> from Star Wars and Kenny Dantley from Corvette Summer. It's not even funny. They're both the <laughs> underdog. They both are uh, out to win over an unattainable woman uh, on a big adventure they were thrust into. Uh, it, it's the whole Corvette Summer really is. Uh, the whole Joseph Campbell uh, quest of the hero and all that, the, the hero's <laughs> journey, it's all there. It's all there. And it, much like Star Wars, some of it uh, takes place in the desert. 
Only difference between uh, Star Wars is uh, tu- Tunisia compared to Corvette Summer, which is uh, Nevada. Okay, so Mark Hamill, Partridge Family. Did you know Mark was in the Partridge Family? I do, because I remember that when we had Danny on. Yes, right. So here's a, here's a little flashback to when uh, Danny was on the show. Um, this was right as the Corvette Summer Blu-ray was being released. And uh, so I thought it was a good time to just try to get some Mark Hamill stories out of Danny Bonaducci. And so Danny reminded me about Mark's very first television appearance. Rebel Force Radio? Yeah, that's what we call How it. How much do I dig that title? Yeah. Hey. Honey, ask me what Jimmy Mack is doing these days. Rebel Force Radio, get me a sword. Dude, that's awesome. I like that a lot. So, yeah, well, thanks, man. And it's been You're going, welcome. you know, hard and strong for a while. And, and so, like I said, every once in a while, we talk about Corvette Summer. And you were in Corvette Summer. I was, but I, I have to correct one thing. You said, uh, you know, if you want to watch, uh, you want to talk about Mark Hamill, you got to talk Corvette Summer. Where else are you going to do it? Well, if you Google this, it'll go back and forth a little bit different. Mark Hamill's first job in television was the Partridge Family. Well, that's right. That's absolutely <laughs> right. I, I know. I, do, do you have any memories? That was the episode, <laughs> if I remember correctly. I haven't seen the episode forever. My, my, I'll just say this, Jimmy. Uh, that my saying, oh, no, 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 uh, Mark Hamill's first job in uh, television was actually the Partridge Family. That was supposed to paralyze you. How the hell do you know that? I just remember it. It's because uh, Lori had braces, and she could pick right. up the radio single on her braces. And so, and, uh, in the most wholesome show ever in the world, I believe, she, they, we asked her because she was playing the wrong song, and we said, what's the matter, Lori? And she said, uh, I got Mick Jagger in my mouth. And we all just went, what? You, can you say that? And they rewrote it, and it came out. Uh, the Rolling Stones are playing in my mouth. So, yeah, that was the one. So how was uh, the Rolling Stones playing in her mouth? You might ask. I will tell you. Her boyfriend or, and or suitor, Mark Hamill, was pacing up and down in front of our house with a little transistor radio because that's how life worked back then. And that was being picked up by the metal in her teeth. So she was getting the Rolling Stones in her mouth because of Mark Hamill. <laughs> Well, we are all wishing uh, Danny Bonaducci the best. He's a legend and a, f- a friend of the show, a friend of Jimmy Max. And so we wish him uh, a speedy recovery. And hopefully, Jimmy, uh, you'll be able to bring us an update here or there so we'll know uh, yeah. how he continues to improve. But uh, according yeah. to his yeah. uh, wife, I've seen it in the press and then heard from you, mm-hmm. uh they, it went as well as as they had hoped it would, and I think uh, if I remember his his first tweet coming out of surgery was, "I survived, bitches." <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, <laughs> yeah. So he survived. His spirit survived, and we'll be getting more stories from him. Uh, definitely, Danny Bonaducci. He's a legend. So awesome, awesome, right. awesome. Hey, let's listen to some voicemail. Let's do it. You must contact me. Play back the entire message. What message? Message after the message. The Emperor commands you to make contact with him. It's a trick. Send no reply. Brandon, California. I just wanted to talk a little bit about Star Wars collectibles. Uh, McFarlane just rebooted their DC Superpowers line and introduced uh, some vehicles like the Batwing for $19.99, and now they're coming out with the uh, Batmobile at the price point of twenty nine ninety nine, And I was just wondering if you thought Hasbro would look into maybe doing some old retro vehicles that are around that same price point, maybe even a little bit more expensive because it's Hasbro, because, you know, they're really pushing their, their retro line. So I was hoping maybe we can get some of those retro vehicles even in that line. So let me know what you think. Thank you, and great work. Thanks a lot. Appreciate the question. Uh, I'm collecting that Superpowers line. In fact, I have the Batwing right here. Oh, wow. So it's in the uh, vintage packaging. Yeah, this is cool. nineteen ninety nine at retail, and it's a very cool. I, I I haven't opened it yet, but it's a very cool little toy. Uh, the wings fold up, and uh, the cockpit opens for Batman to get into. And what's fun about it is it's sort of the nineteen eighty nine Batman shape, uh, but with sort of a superpowers 1980s kind of paint scheme and stuff. So yeah, it's great. And the thing that 
just amazes me about McFarlane is how he's able to keep the prices so low. The action figures are south of $10. The, uh, the, the vehicles are south of $20. And our caller brings up an interesting thought, Jim. With all of this vintage retro fever going on at Hasbro, where are the vehicles? I mean, the whole point of the, the size, the scale of those figures was that they wanted this expansive line that would include beasts and uh, and vehicles. They had to be able to ride in ships and stuff. That's what it, that's, that was the whole point of it. Uh, we haven't seen that. And I think if we did, we'd probably be looking at something like a land speeder going on sale for $50, not $20. If Hasbro did put out a bargain line that was repurposing old molds, vintage what difference does it make? It never make it to the shelves anyway. None of their stuff ever does. Whoever sees this stuff on store shelves anymore, Hasbro's distribution has got to be the worst in the business. I, I look all the time. I never see anything at retail ever. So, you know, you order them online and stuff, and then they show up months, sometimes a year or so later. And you're like, oh, great, here it is. I got it. That's it really sucks the fun out of collecting. It, in my opinion. it does. Uh, the other thing that's interesting, like with the superpowers line, and I've seen this with Marvel Legends and some other lines, where people people assume if it's on the shelf that it's not selling well, because collectors oh. are so accustomed to walking into stores and never finding anything that they're you know they're oh. into, particularly Star Wars collectors. And uh, that's not always that's not always the case. A lot of times it means that they sold out, they sold well, and the stores. You know, like a Walmart, man, they are, they've got the algorithms. They know exactly what stores to, to, re, to uh, restock at, which stores not to, shifting it all around. It's all done by, I'm sure it's probably a lot of it done by AI by now, uh, knowing Walmart. And um, so, you know, you walk into it. It's so like you're, to your point, it's refreshing for me to be able to walk into a Walmart and go, oh, they have some of the new superpowers figures in there. Um, somewhere along the line, and Hasbro, I feel like, pioneered this. Do you remember when they had uh, promotions like, you know, the Galactic Hunt? And you had to hunt for action. You know, if they would be short-packed figures or they would have, you know, maybe uh, the packaging would be slightly different metallic borders or something like that. I feel like they're the ones that really pushed this idea of scarcity and hunting and all of that. And I just want to go in. Can you just let me buy it? Just let me walk into a store and buy it. I know. Why you, why, I don't need to make a game out of such it. A <laughs> silly gimmick, you know? I mean, stop stop tooling with us and just give the consumer what they want. Because in, in the long run, I think Hasbro is losing a lot of money because of the lack of accessibility to their product. It's crazy. So I don't get it. Yeah. I don't get it. Hey, I speaking of uh, and stuff. retro vintage, I did pick this up. This just arrived today. So this is the box set, uh, the second, well, you know, the, the vintage retro line that they released for Star Wars, which had, the, I think, the first in there? six figures. So they released those on individual cards, and then they put them together in a box set for the Disney, oh, I see. Um, the Disney stores. And this is the second. So you can get, in this box set is uh, Ben, Obi-Wan, Kenobi, uh, the Death, Star, or Death Squad Commander, a Jawa, not a vinyl yeah. cape, a cloth cape, Jawa, a, a Tusken Raider, Sand Person, uh, R two D two, and C three PO. And here's the best thing about three PO: he's vac metalized. So they were able to well, use to they were able to use the vac metal uh, vac metal technology on this three PO. And Hasbro won't do it for the modern line, which is just crazy. Oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Why? Why not? Environmental why not? concerns, Jim. Environmental oh. concerns. Yeah, so oh, here he is. is. Oh, that's a really great looking figure. Retro vintage sure, like, C3PO. Remember when, remember when those things were on the pegs back in the 70s? So that's very nice. That's yeah. very nice. Yeah. I just don't like that big retro stuff. I hate on it. There. I hate it. I am it says, curious. Yo. I was very curious how the Obi Wan Kenobi figure would be. I was wondering what color his hair might turn out. You know, there was some variations of the Obi Wan Kenobi figure gray hair, white hair. And then there was yep. also variations in the vinyl that they had on the cape. Sometimes it was more red, sometimes more brown. But, yeah. Is this how you remember it, Jim? 
<laughs> that is exactly is this how what I it was like Jason. in the old days? <laughs> yeah, except the price tag. They were only about a buck oh, ninety or something. Right, right. <laughs> Um, but anyway, it's, it's like a dollar eighty six or something. Back then, they'd even mess around with like the ninety nines, like how everything is now. So you're right. I remember eighty six was a popular uh, yeah <laughs> amount of like, change. How much is that? It's a dollar eighty six. And then you're a kid. You're standing there at the counter. You're counting your pennies out. I, was, I got it. Yeah. So ah, the memories. Oh, it's memories. All nostalgia. All right. Well, let's it's do another fun nostalgia. But but I I will say this. You know. I'm not so nostalgic about Star Wars action figures because I've been collecting them nonstop for 46 years. So it's hard to be nostalgic for something that you're still actively involved in. That's what I think. I'll write the book when the story is finished. Hey, guys, this is Paul V. All right, let's do another voicemail. I've been wondering for a while now how accessible a silk is going to be, you know, for regular folk. Uh, You know, David said he's designed it so that you don't need to have seen Clone Wars or Rebels to enjoy the series, but... I think we all know Ahsoka's really going to be Rebel Season 5. And so, you know, for, for those of us that have followed our journey for the last 15 years, I know it's going to be amazing. But what about, you know, the countless unwashed masses who've never seen any of the anime series? You know, there, there are still people who think Grogu is literally Yoda when he was a baby, and that Solo must be set before the Phantom Menace because of Darth Maul. So how much enjoyment will they be able to squeeze out of a series that's a culmination of over a decade of storytelling they've never seen? I mean, either way, I know I'm in for a good time, but I worry it might not gain a foothold with those that, you know, that aren't familiar with her story. I don't know. What do you guys think? Why do you worry? That's what I think. Why do you worry? Why do you care what the unwashed masses are thinking? We're super fans around here. We are your people. You don't have to go and associate with all of this, these ne'er-do-wells and yahoos that you run into in your day-to-day existence. Don't even talk Star Wars with them. Forget them. You got RFR. You got our community. This is where you belong. All this hand wringing over. Oh, I wonder how the non fan is going to know who Ezra is. <laughs> who cares? They're not fans. We've been in there. We've been in the trenches. We've been putting in time. We've been paying our dues. We've been sweating it out, waiting, anticipating. We deserve this. Not the unwashed masses. They could they could ride our coattails all day long, <laughs> and they can ask us questions. They can ask us, why are Ahsoka's lightsabers white? Why, why, why this? Why that? I said, go watch the animated series, you slacker. That's how you do it. You don't say you're worrying about them. I'm so worried about people. Who cares? They're not fans. They can kiss my... Give me a beep, Swank. <laughs> Wrong one. <laughs> That's for you. That's for you for being slow on the special effects. Oh, where's, where's the beep? The beep. Where's right, the beep? That's my rant. Let me just say, that's my rant. But I think, okay, let's have the discussion. It's a fair discussion yeah. to have. Are people going to, how are they going to make the casual fan who just watches live action stuff on Disney Plus? They don't watch the animated series. They've never seen Clone Wars or Rebels. How are they going to make the average fan, number one, care about Ahsoka's mission or promise to go save Ezra. How are they going to get people to care about Ezra? Flashbacks, maybe? We'll get some glimpses of live action, recreations of things that happened in Rebels. That could be interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, But to just simply say, well, Ahsoka is going to be the next season of Rebels. I think I think you're cutting corners too much. I think Ahsoka is going to be presenting a very original story to Star Wars with Rebels infusion going through it without it necessarily being something that you can not understand unless you've seen four seasons of Rebels. I don't think there's going to they're going to be making people pay those dues. What do you think? Swan? Well, I think th- you could have said the same thing about, well, how do you make people care about, you know, when going into episode four, how do you make people care about the Clone Wars? How, how do you make people care about the Jedi? How do you make people care about the legacy of, of Luke's father? Well, you, gr- you create a really great story that drops these little tidbits in. The fact that it's already filled in and exists for people to go see, 
I think is inconsequential. I think that the smart play, and I think what Dave Filoni is likely going to do, we've got some quotes coming up here later from him about this type of thing, is that he's just got to tell the best story he possibly can and not worry about who knows what, as long as he doesn't conflict to some great degree with what's already been laid, the track that's already been laid, I think it's going to be fine. But the 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 this this show will not be a success based on people's nostalgia for Rebels and their affection for Rebels. It's only going to be a success if the show is good. Now, when our caller talks about fear, <laughs> worry, I think we're I think it's coming from a good place where he wants Star Wars to succeed. He wants people to love it. Coming. He wants people around the water the cooler to be like, "Hey, that Ahsoka show is pretty good." Like we had with Mando, especially with the first season of Mando. We were like the big guys on campus because everybody wanted to be a Star Wars fan again after that that first season of Mando was on. True. And I don't mean to belittle our call or anything. Oh, I, I know. The rant I know was we that was that was purely that's purely me just making note of the trope yeah. of, of fans being concerned about non-fans understanding. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, I was really late to that Harry Potter game. Nobody <laughs> was holding my hand through that. <laughs> Nobody was worried about me. Not a damn person was worried about me. Swank called me a muggle <laughs> on the air. And here I am taking it. I don't know what a bugle is. What do I care? Well, now I know, Swank, and it hurts. Yeah, you know, when they were so, releasing that that Dumbledore movie, was anybody saying, oh, my gosh, are they going to know who Dumbledore is? Are they going to care who Dumbledore is? Well, you got to sit no. down and watch all eight Harry Potter movies before you can go. No. And, and, and you might argue that the Dumbledore movie didn't do all that well because the story itself wasn't compelling enough to get muggle folk in there and watch it. So yes, you can play to the fans. You should play to the fans, but at the end of the day, it has to be a great story. And I think Dave Filoni, I don't think, I know Dave Filoni knows how to tell great stories. I think the biggest thing is to sell Ahsoka to the casual fan. Yeah. Because we've been around Ahsoka for so many years and the, the influence that Ashley Eckstein has had on Ahsoka is something that kind of pushed the character into the stratosphere, I believe. So it's almost like starting from ground zero again, because Little bit. you have yeah. to, you brought up, nobody cared about the Jedi. Nobody cared about the rebels or this or that when the first star Wars came out, but you know who we did care about? We immediately cared. We liked and cared about those protagonists immediately. Absolutely. We could connect with them. So what is it about Ahsoka that casual fans are going to connect with? Fans who might not know much about Ahsoka. Fans who don't really know or care who Ashley Eckstein is. How are they going to accept live action Ahsoka? Will they connect with the character in the same way that Star Wars fans eventually started to connect with animated Ahsoka. I think they're really two different sides of a coin. And I think it's going to be interesting to see how the Rosario Ahsoka endures. And I think it will, because I love Rosario Dawson. I think she's amazing. And uh, if she puts the right amount of special sauce into her performance, uh, Ahsoka will be as liked and loved as the Ashley version was. But I still believe that needs to be earned. I don't think we've seen enough of the Rosario Ahsoka to jump to the conclusion that that take on the character is going to have the same amount of impact as the Ashley Eckstein-fueled animated version of Ahsoka. I still have to get proof of this. And I want to get proof. I want it to succeed. Yeah. But we still have to wait and see. Ashley's work can't just be transferred over to Rosario in any kind of, in any kind of way. No, uh, it can't just happen like that. Right. Right. It can, but boy, can it, if you, if you do fall in love with the character through Rosario in this series, are you in luck? Because you have a ton, you have a decade plus of great backstory that you can uh, just fill your boots on, you know? Yeah. And then things will come full circle and the Ashley version will have to prove <laughs> Herself to the Rosario fans. Yeah, I don't know if the uh, animated version really is going to hold up. 
Everybody's been talking about it like it's the greatest thing. I don't know. Closer, I have good news. Oh, we got great news. As I mentioned at the top of the show, August 23rd, 2023, it was announced uh, this week on all of the uh, main Star Wars channels that that will be the premiere. So that is a mere two months, two weeks away. I don't want to. I don't want it to be here too soon because that means summer will be almost over, and I'm really, really loving the warm weather. And I don't want it to be over, but uh, I guess one thing will certainly make the oncoming fall a little bit uh, easier to swallow, and that's brand new Star Wars. Rumor is eight episodes. That's not been officially confirmed, but that follows suit. Eight episodes starting August twenty. Third, and with it, of course, yes. Rebel Force Radio after shows. Can't wait. I'm really looking forward to it because I think this series is going to be pretty impactful. And we've seen a lot of cool visuals. Uh, we're getting introduced to these new characters like Balin Skull and Shin Hati. And, uh, and, and of course, Diana Lee and Asanto's returning is Morgan Elsbeth, the magistrate. Um, and uh, we're going to get our first taste of live-action Grand Admiral Thrawn, something that's been 30-plus years in the making, the live-action debut of Thrawn. Can you believe it? Holy smokes. Back when I was I was still in college when Heir to the Empire came out, and I devoured that book, read it twice in one week. I wow. loved it so much. Yeah, it was great. I mean, really, it was a big boost to my fandom at a time when there was nothing Star Wars to collect, read, watch, participate in. It was, there's nothing there. I mean, so how many times can you read it. Steve Sandwich, Steve Sandsweets from concept to collectible? Mm -hmm. I mean, I love it. It's a great book, one of my favorites. But you know, there, only so well, many I mean, times like, to read it. That was like a rare example of uh, yeah. some a fresh publication coming out in that that same time frame, and then the floodgates just opened once Heir to the Empire became a New York Times bestseller and it was at the top of the list and I mean the list not all of these splinter uh, niche lists it was the top 100 <laughs> and um, that was a big deal so uh, and I, th I think Heir to the Empire you know it's going to have uh, I think it's, its influence will be felt on both the Ahsoka series and the upcoming Dave Filoni film rumors are that that'll be the name of the full yeah, I've film. heard that too. Yeah, I've heard that too, and that would just be brilliant. There was a new video that dropped. Not a lot of new footage in it, but no? we can we can play it here, so yeah. folks can uh, take a look the at TV it with spot. us. Yeah, I started hearing whispers about Thrawn's return as heir to the Empire. We have to prepare for the worst. Mon Mothma. Yeah. The Jedi fell a long time ago. There aren't many left. Oh, now that's new. Okay, so Sabine... Yeah. Perhaps it is time to begin again. Yeah, Sabine Greensaver in a duel with, uh, what is it, Synth? What's her name? Synth something? Her name is Shin Hati. Oh, Shin Hati. And Why did I get, I get Synth? <laughs> Shin Hati. Synth. That's right. That's Ivana uh, Sakno. Ivana Sakno yeah. is... Yeah. She's, she's got the orange saber, yeah. much like uh, Balin Skull. And and you see Sabine, she has the green lightsaber, which I think we, we can assume is a S Ezra's saber. She's She has it. Yeah. Well, and she we ignites she can... it here. Oh, no. Let's see. It's already ignited. Oh, no. She ignites it right here. And there are some stills. There's at least one still that has come out. Uh, or somebody might have grabbed it off of one of the trailers and they zoomed in on that lightsaber hilt and outside of there being just a, a difference in the size of the emitter, largely because the physics of live action Star Wars versus the physics of animated Star Wars, some things are just going to be a little chunkier, a little bit bigger and live action. And uh, But aside from that one difference, this does look to be Ezra's saber for sure. Confirmed. Confirmed. So I, I think they started selling a replica of that live-action saber hilt at the Disney 
already? No edge. kidding. Or okay. Yeah. All right. yeah. Uh, I, I seem to recall seeing some photos of that online. So she gets to duel with Shin. Shin's got the orange saber. That's pretty cool. How are casual fans going to understand how, why she knows how to use the saber? How are they going to Who cares? They'll explain <laughs> it. They'll just say, I trained with the great Jedi Caleb Doom. You know, she'll say something like that. Right. And then people go, well, who's Caleb Doom? Doom? Who's it? It's Freddie Prince Jr. Just watch that anime. Right, and he got got rescued by the Bad Batch. So go watch the Bad Batch. Yeah, you have three animated (laughs) series now you have to watch before you even can see one second of the new Ahsoka show. Yeah, I'll tell you what. you, You mentioned Harry Potter. I'll tell you. Another group of insufferable fans, and that's the Tolkienites. I remember when the oh. Lord of the Rings movies were coming out, all I'd ever seen was the animated Hobbit in school at one point. And those those Lord of the Rings people, it's like it's, it's like the snobby sommelier in you know at wine tasting at a, at, a, at a restaurant. Like they're like, oh no, you've never read. Oh, you're only going to watch the movie. You've never read the Great Tolkien. No, I yeah. haven't read it. No, I don't need to read three and a half chapters all about, you know, the the Shire and what it looks like before you even get to characters. Hey, if that's your cup of tea, great. But, you know, but they were always very uh, gatekeepy, those Tolkien fans. Well, it's a backup what you're saying. <laughs> uh, years ago, I, I, I know uh, Richard Roper, the film critic, and uh, he, he was uh, Roger Ebert's last partner after Gene yeah. Sisko passed away. And again, a- another dude I know through radio. And um, I asked him once, I said, how tough are the Star Wars fans when you write stuff about Star Wars? I, I think I asked him this primarily because I might have had a few things to say about one of his re- recent <laughs> columns or something. I don't know. Uh-huh. I said, how tough are they on you? And he's like, Star Wars fans are tough, but they're not the toughest. And I said, well... Spill, who's the toughest? Lord of the Rings fans. There it is. The Tolkienites. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I can see that. <laughs> I can easily see that. No problem. No problem. So so that's at least one group that's worse than Star Wars yeah. fans. So no, we got I that love Lord of the Rings, but to your point, Jim, like no one was looking out for me. No one was worried about me as I was going into those movies and, you know, backstories and stuff like that. But they were great stories. They were done so well. I loved the characters, and I was there opening weekend for the, the following two because I was so excited to see them. Here's the thing that drove me crazy about Lord of the Rings. I'll make this quick. <laughs> um, I, w- I wasn't familiar, really, with the books either. I saw the animated version when I was a kid. And right. I, that didn't really stick with me. It seemed, like, very complicated with a lot of moving parts, so I, I never got sucked into it as a kid. As an adult, when those films came out, naturally I was... I was uh, interested and encouraged to go see them. So I did, you know, and I go see them with my buddy, Kurt. See every one of these movies with Kurt. Kurt is a big Tolkien guy. He reads, he's one of those guys who has to read the trilogy once a year. It's like oh, a yeah. ritual for it's him. It's a yeah. tradition for so a lot of everything. Yeah. So I'm getting this, this great story. Peter Jackson, what an amazing job he did with that film. It's so rich and it's dense and it's deep. It's not, but it's not everything from those, those Lord of the Rings books. Every, I mean, some characters are even completely eliminated. I just remember after seeing, maybe it was the, the second one. And I was talking about things that happened that I thought were so cool in the movie. I was so excited about it. Pumped up. We saw it opening night. And I, I was so excited. I was like, say, oh, it was so great when this happened and when that happened. And, and Kurt would say, well, you know, that didn't really happen. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? I just saw the movie. It's fresh. I know what happened. And he's like, that's not what happened. What was supposed to happen was, oh, no, 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 I'd have to sit there and listen to this, the most boring <laughs> breakdown. I'm like, oh, the movie was so much better than what you're describing to me. He's like, well, you know, the integrity of Tolkien. I said, shut up. <laughs> just, oh. oh, they give you some big professorial uh, dissertation. Uh, oh, it just sucks all the fun right out of it, doesn't it? It sure did. Well, that didn't happen. Well, I just saw it happen. That big blocking. I love it. What really happened in this fantasy (laughs) universe was. (laughs) Oh, revisionist history happening in Tolkien. (laughs) 
we get that way about Lucas, you know? We're, yeah, we're yeah, Lucas yeah. We one. all have our. <laughs> I mean, we have, have a lot thing, to say but, too. But, so, uh, I, I, you, you know, know, I can honestly say that when any when any time someone has ever approached me, you know, uh, a, 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 let's call it the Star Wars muggles, right? Uh, the the you know the plain clothes uh, fans, when they approach me and talk about something that they really enjoyed. I'm very, very reluctant to ever really correct them, unless there's something really, really wrong. But I don't want to do or say anything that takes that in that joy away from them. Well, you know, that's not actually. So I'll listen to weird theories. I got a buddy that calls me all the time. Uh, he's a very casual fan, but he watches all the Disney Plus shows. And so he'll call me after a, an episode of Mandalorian or Book of Boba Fett. And he'll have all these theories. And I know most of them are just impossible because, you know, I've watched Clone Wars, I've watched Rebels, all this stuff, but I don't want to burst his bubble. I'll just be like, yeah, that's a, that's a cool idea. Yeah, maybe. Because that's such a and part of And then you end every conversation enjoyment. with, uh, you end every one of those conversations by saying, listen to the after show. <laughs> and then that's where you're off the hook, you know? Yeah. Because, yeah, you might want to listen to the after show. That's all I'm going to say to you. And it'll be like, oh, wow, wait, what? All these mysteries might be solved on this this podcast. I I, I must listen now. It is a good way get for another, you to uh, we get another click. Introduce another your click. your Star Wars Muggle friends uh, to <laughs> the Lodge of Don't world. talk to me. Don't talk to me. Listen to my show. <laughs> Gets me out of a lot of conversations, actually. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, let's. So talk that's about great. We have a, a new spot. We have a countdown oh. to Ahsoka. A countdown. What is the official countdown, Jason? Two months, two weeks. Right now. Two months, two weeks. So that's two and a half months, mostly. Yeah. Uh, so rest up, because we're gonna be. Yeah, we're gonna be rocking into the fall with this Ahsoka show. I, I think it's gonna be amazing. I think people are gonna really uh, fire up the switchboard because I think it's going to introduce a lot of new concepts to Star Wars that we might really be wanting without even know it, without even knowing it. So yeah, we'll see how that all plays out. All right. Like I said earlier, the on newsstands this week is the big cover story from uh, Empire Magazine, all about Ahsoka and the big article there. Ahsoka is a wanderer. At the start of her series is Dave Filoni. She walks a path that died out a long time ago. And, Jim, they've been uh, kind of dripping stuff out from this magazine all week, mm -hmm. uh, starting late last week. And it, I think once the magazine's out, people have had a chance. I think most of the content, if not all of the content, and I'm sure they'll have bonus articles, too, they'll throw out after the fact, if yeah. this is getting the clicks, this is all about the clicks, of course. Um, so we'll have the all the skinny. But Filoni in this in this lead article does say that she is indeed a wanderer. He says, in a lot of ways, wary of any organization mm. as such because of the power that comes with it as a group. But her wariness of institutions contributes to the loneliness of her journey. She walks a path oh. that basically died out a long time ago, and there aren't many left like her, if any. So that's a lonely thing. What is life like if you are a loner, you have a very small circle of friends? What is it like then when you try to open back up? So her being burned by the Jedi Council has made her really distrustful of any kind of organization. And so we obviously know that she um, becomes fulcrum and she works for the rebellion, but we know that this series takes place after the events of return of the Jedi. Does it not? Yes. So yes, indeed she's already been through this once. So what is Dave talking about here about her wariness of, or her, uh, yeah, she's wary of any organ of of any organization as such because of the power that comes with it as a group. So we know that the obviously the Jedi Council disappointed her. She becomes yes. fulcrum. She she backs the the rebellion. 
She works as an agent for the rebellion. Right, right. Which doesn't necessarily mean she's a full-fledged member of the rebellion. Well, that's she's true. She's not standing around in the Yavin war room next to uh, crazy Dodonna and Mon Mothma <laughs> and all of them making decisions. You know, rubbing elbows with Bail Organa. This isn't what she's doing. She's working as a rogue, as a maverick, on her own. Yeah, she's a spy, and essentially. Dispensing information. Yeah, yeah. That she thinks will help the side against the Empire. Because, obviously, she doesn't want to see the Empire succeed. She knows the right. Empire is fueled by the dark side of the Force. But she's not a full-fledged member of the Rebellion. And here's the thing. Ahsoka's distrust of organizations. We all know that stems out of the events that happen in the final episodes of uh, season five of Clone Wars when she gets wrongfully accused and she, uh, she, she gets absolved at the end but still walks away because she sees how fragile the whole system is and how it's so easy for someone to just go down the vortex and nobody... <laughs> It's just like me going to see Harry Potter. Nobody cares. Nobody's going to reach out a hand to help. <laughs> They're just going to let her go down the vortex. That's what she felt like was happening. Yeah. So she split and left the organization. Now, a big question we've been asking. For you young Ahsoka kids, just say this. Ahsoka was canceled amongst the other Jedi. and then She was. And then they realized she's not so bad. So they wanted right. to let her back in. And she yeah. goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. You were so quick to drop me. Right. With very little uh, effort to defend me or stand by my side. So, you know what? I don't want you. I'm leaving. Yeah. I'm dropping you. I'm right. canceling exactly. you. So she's I, out. I think she was the first cancel culture uh, casualty of, <laughs> of the Jedi Council. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So here's the thing, though. From the very moment Ahsoka was introduced in the Clone Wars in 2008, the question was always asked by fans. Well, if Anakin had a Padawan, clearly she did not survive the Clone Wars because we don't see her in the original trilogy. Mm -hmm. I think, now, despite we do know Ahsoka survives the events of the Clone Wars now, I still think it's a valid argument to be saying, What's up with Ahsoka during the events of the original trilogy? We don't see her. She's a Jedi. She could be extremely valuable to the Rebellion right now. Mm -hmm. And you know she wants to take out the Empire. How could we don't ever see her? Well, here, it's, again, her hang-up with organizations mm. might get reinforced somehow in the events between the end of the Rebel series... And the beginning of the original trilogy. There might have been a time where Ahsoka actually was actively working with the Rebellion as a full-fledged rebel. Mm. Like hanging out in the Yavin War Room. Okay. With Mon Mothma and that crazy Dodonna guy in the gang. But she gets burned somehow. Again. And what we're learning about the Rebellion during the period of Andor... You got some shady characters. You got guys like Luthen. You got uh, nuts like Saw Guerrera and all the infighting. So you can imagine that that might actually leave a real bad taste in the mouth of someone like Ahsoka, who's seen what she's seen over the years. So I could see her, to your point, about getting closer to the rebellion, starting to see some of this infighting and mistrust and all of that, and then backing off. Yeah, she I bails. definitely could see that. She bails and then just decides to work in the shadows, trying to trip up the Empire and the Sith in any way she can on her own from the shadows. Yeah. So that might be exactly why we don't see her during the original trilogy era. And then that story will be told in this Ahsoka series. Maybe. Maybe. I, I'm sure... <laughs> I, I, I know this is deep end stuff, guys, but I mean, this is the type of stuff that if I was sitting in the writing room with Dave Filoni, this is the stuff I'd be bringing up because it is blue sky, that yeah. period between the end of Rebels and the beginning of the uh, of Rogue One, let's just say. That's blue sky. 
it is at least until the Andor series comes out in 2024, which will fill in some of the gaps. But that's a very specific story about a very you know specific group of people. Yeah. Um, so it may be easy to work around any of that stuff. Well, do you think that the Ahsoka series is going to be a la Bo- Book of Boba Fett, where it'll be telling two par- parallel stories at the same time, but in two different two different eras or periods in Ahsoka's life? Uh, or will this really be post-Return of the Jedi, firmly in sort of the Mando era, Mando, Book of Boba Fett, at least the one well, the one storyline. Um, I think it's going to jump around. I think yeah, it's going to jump around. I feel like it sh- it's almost has to. Just the mere inclusion of Hayden Christensen makes me believe. Oh, well, yeah, there's that, right. Unless he strictly is appearing as a force spirit. But Disney seemed reluctant to incorporate four spirits into their storytelling. I know they did with Qui-Gon Jinn at the end of the Kenobi thing. Very quickly, though. I, it was it was a very, very quick. Mm-hmm. And you had Yoda with Luke in <laughs> The Last Jedi. Yeah, yeah. But but they're not leaning into it in the same way that George did with, with the original trilogy at all. You had... Luke and Leia at the end of The Rise of Skywalker. Yeah. But yeah, how, how George did it with them appearing and offering all this guidance and exactly. stuff. Exactly. Well, Yoda served that role. In The Last Jedi, Yoda served that role. So, yeah, I, mean, yeah, I would say that know? the Yoda-Luke exchange in Last Jedi was probably the closest that the yes. Disney era has come in, in leaning into the, the, Force, the Force ghosts. Uh, well, of course, the Clone Wars couldn't do it very well. I mean, they did it a little bit with Mortis because that particular brand of force use was not established within the Jedi order at that point. So that, that was not a thing then. Right. It was only Qui-Gon had, he had a reason for it. You're seeing me because this is a a virgins in the force where we're at, you know, this is a a, a conduit that promotes my, my, vision to you so yeah but we'll see i i think four spirits uh might have some potential in maybe the dave filoni film mm. or the ray film if you're shooting that film about ray um be with bring me back luke be with me you have to bring back luke you could probably bring back a force spirit leia too, make it look just like carrie fisher a different voice or, or the ai voice yeah yeah why not why not? Hey, this is Dave Filoni, and you are listening to Rebel Force Radio with Jason and Jimmy. Moving on here with uh, more from Dave Filoni. Uh, this gets to where our caller was talking about, about the how accessible Ahsoka is going to be. He says, she has one, this is again quoting Dave, she has one foot in the Star Wars that a lot of people know because of her connection to Anakin. And yet she's all new and can go in her own direction in her own way. I think that makes her an interesting bridge between what came before and what's really possible. That's absolutely the utility that I have seen in Ahsoka Tano as a character for a long time. Because Star Wars, she could be sort of the next Luke Skywalker in the sense that she is a tether to both to, to, to the two major eras of Star Wars, the, 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 the Jedi era of the, the prequels connection to Anakin Skywalker, the chosen one has a tangential connection to Luke Skywalker. But then, as you say, has this blue sky future ahead. We don't really know about her species, how long they can live. We, we have no idea, you know, look at how right. old Wookiees are. Look at how old Yoda species gets. Who knows? Um, but when Dave talks about her having kind of, you know, w- one foot in each space, uh, I really, uh, I like that. I think it's really important. I it, like it a lot, too. Yeah. I like it a lot, too. I mean, she, you know, she she just has that connection to, uh, and, and generationally, too. Mm-hmm. Her appearance was hot on the heels of the prequel era. And uh, you could still consider her appearance to be part of the prequel era, really, because uh, it was fans of the prequels that 
carried on with Clone Wars, but it was the younger fans that really, I think, made Clone Wars special and important. Yes. Yes. Um, the ones who might have been just a little too young to appreciate any of the prequel films in the theaters, they were primed and ready by the time the Clone Wars was hidden. And they were really able to uh, latch onto that and make it their Star Wars. And Ahsoka is just that character that was, you know, definitely interacting with the legends. Right. Obi Wan, Anakin, Yoda. And then associating with the crew of the ghost. Mm -hmm. And now she's going to be, she, she has dropped into the Mandoverse. So with Luke yeah, Skywalker uh, there's, at one point. Yes. So there, but there is that there's, there's a blank spot there in the middle there. And, and it's the original trilogy era specifically where mm. Ahsoka is a non-factor. And I want the series to explain to us exactly why. And that could establish even more depth to her character, an even stronger connection to the original trilogy that maybe we never even knew existed. Yeah, I would love to see a series that could sort of... And I, I don't know... Look, I don't want it to be cameo of the week or anything like that. I don't need it to hold my hand... But I would love to see it happen, you know, in parallel with the original trilogy, but maybe from Ahsoka's perspective throughout. And you could have little keystone Easter egg moments here and there done in a very tasteful way. Uh, that I think that would be really, really interesting because we don't have a lot yeah. of knowledge of the original trilogy era outside of the original trilogy. It's really our only vantage point into that. And of course, we, we always have to keep in mind that George Lucas, his fingerprints are all over the creation of this character. So. Yes. But yet, Ahsoka still provides more flexibility going into the future with her as opposed to just about any other George Lucas created characters. I think. I, Maybe I, outside I agree. Maybe outside of 3 I think you hit the nail on the head when you said the multi generational connection, connection to her really, yeah. because even with Luke you know that prequel the prequel babies and the Clone Wars babies don't have the connection to Luke that we do they do have it with no. Ahsoka and in a lot of ways she really could be the future of the franchise as far as that sort of that that central character that, that then all of these spokes sort of come off of if they took their time, they could have crafted the whole sequel trilogy around a character like Ahsoka and have her mm. interacting with the other characters and not being so concerned with them stealing all the spotlight because Ahsoka had already interacted with them, you know, previously. Yeah. Characters like R2 and uh, Yoda, 3PO, Chewbacca. I mean... Those are characters that, well, Yoda, not necessarily, but he could always be brought back as, as a force ghost at any time. Yeah. And, uh, well, they, she they did really interact him. with R2 and 3PO quite a bit. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Chewie. And, and, uh, and, and, yeah, and Anakin. And then we see she has a connection now with Luke and Book of Boba Fett. And it was uh, like so easy to digest seeing the two of them on screen together. I don't know if it was for everyone, but it was for me. I was seeing Ahsoka and Luke together, live action, sharing a scene, and it seemed like the most natural thing in the world to me as a Star Wars fan. Ahsoka just fits in. And that can't be said for all the sequel characters. Some of them, yeah, maybe more than others. But not all of them, that's for sure. No, Some of them stuck not. out like sore thumbs. And Ahsoka fits in. Yeah. For sure. Uh, last quote from Filoni in this article, at least what we've been given online. The bigger question is, what will Ahsoka's co-creator George Lucas think? Dave Filoni says, it's almost like when you turn in a big paper at school. It's like, here it is. Fingers crossed it makes the grade. <laughs> <laughs> so Dave hoping, obviously, like the rest of us, that uh, he gets... 
George's thumbs up. Uh, no photos that I'm aware of of George on set of Ahsoka. I don't think that's come out. It would not surprise me to see something like right. that come out at some point because he and Dave are still quite close. Yeah, Ahsoka was shot during pandemic time, so maybe mm. George is like, eh, I got to put on a mask. I'm just going to stay home. Yeah. Yeah. And but, there's uh, been, there was some recent footage online of George getting out of a black car and going into a hotel lobby. I don't know if you happened to catch that, Jim. And no. he was definitely not looking good. He was being oh, no. assisted pretty heavily by the uh, his security. Um, uh, he was looking wobbly. That's the way I would I would put it. Wobbly. Uh, well, you know, he's he's going getting into his later 70s now. Isn't he 80? And, uh, to me, to, Is what's he not, that? Isn't he 80? No, not yet. Did he just mm -hmm. turn 79 this year? I think maybe I, he's I'm 79. Really sure. Is he? Wow. Yeah. George Lucas is 79. So, yeah. Uh, hmm. And he's a guy who, uh, yeah, yeah. I hate, I hate to hear that. Yeah, honestly, it was it was tough. I've, to I've watch. never <laughs> thought, I've never thought George was like you know the poster boy for keeping yourself in shape or anything. But right, um, but but I, I I do note that the months are are coming off the calendar, and uh, George is is definitely getting uh, he's getting up there, you know, and uh, yeah. I, I hate to hear that. By the way, if you're a subscriber to Empire Magazine, you get this special commemorative cover, which is really cool looking. I love this, this sort of black and white, very uh, artsy photo of uh, Ahsoka, along with that sort of world between worlds, uh, I don't know what you would call it, uh, star chart kind of thing behind her. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're a... Uh, Empire Magazine subscriber, you get a special edition cover. Um, something else, and this is sort of a leak. I think it's a leak from this, the, the uh, Empire Magazine, because I haven't seen this released on the Empire website, but it is being reported by um, the, what is this? The SF Gazette. Oh, that's uh, uh, like a science fiction. Okay, the Sci-Fi like Gazette. Science. Okay, yeah. So they've got a piece on the air about uh, Ray Stevenson's character Skull, Balin Skull. Is it? I always want to call it Skull, but I think it's Skull. There's an O in there, so I, it's not. You could probably skull. get away with Skull. You could probably get away with Skull. Balin Skull. Like head. Yeah. So. There's an article in here, um, or they're they're referencing rather an article, uh, or, or could be from that other uh, piece that just the whole thing hasn't been released. But a few more details about Balin Skull. And Jim, I'm afraid that your theory, as cool as it was last week, is wrong. He is yeah. not from another time. He's not from the future or the past in the Star Wars universe, or from a. He's not a Viking dimension. Jedi. No, no, he's not. He is Damn. indeed a former Jedi Knight who survived the events of Order sixty six and became yes. a mercenary for hire, which is why he's doing the bidding of Grand Admiral Thrawn. So confirmed, he is working for Thrawn. He's a former Jedi, survived Order sixty six, and I'm guessing that. Um, his apprentice is this, uh, I can't keep for Shin name. God, Shin. Shin. Shin, Shin, thank you. His apprentice yeah. is Shin. It, it, it seems like they're, uh, a set, you know, they come yeah. together, <laughs> um, with the orange sabers and all. Right. Uh, looking forward to hearing what the, the rationale is be, behind orange sabers. Now we know Ahsoka uses a white saber two white sabers but that's supposed to signify her uh independence and her uh she doesn't uh she 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 marches to the beat of her own drum uh what does the orange signify it's like yeah you know we could be kind of dirty but we're not sith you know? yeah we're, we're not really we're not fully red we still got a little yellow mixed in there <laughs> 
who knows what that means, but it's striking and cool, and I'm happy to see new colors being introduced to the lightsabers because in the old Dark Horse Tales of the Jedi comic book that has no connection to the Tales of the Jedi animated shorts, series of shorts that came out last year. This is about Jedi that existed thousands of years prior to the Battle of Yavin. And they all had multicolored lightsabers. Any color you could think of. It was beautiful watching them all <laughs> storm into battle. It was like the 4th of July. Uh, and then the, the prequels rolled around. It's just like, nah, red, green, blue. That's it. That's it. And I was bummed. You know, Samuel Jackson goes in there. How about a purple one, man? And George is like, no. Yeah, cool. No, he said, yeah. He no, said, no, he said, no. I'll think first, about it. there's the video of him, and he's like, no, no. There's only three, three colors, three yeah. colors. And then he kind of, you know, then he, if I, if I remember the video clip right, he's like, well, we'll see what we can do, or something yeah, like. Because suddenly something he like realized he, he'd he, be like considered cool by Samuel Jackson, which is a goal all middle aged to older white guys want. <laughs> To be considered cool by Samuel Jackson. I right. mean, that's like bucket list stuff, you know. <laughs> Sam Jackson thinks I'm cool. We do have a, a quote from uh, the late Ray Stevenson uh, the, that, yes. again, is probably coming from this Empire magazine. But he's, he's talking about Balin Skull in a little bit more detail than he did at Star Wars Celebration. He says he is not genocidal, talking about Balin Skull. He is not genocidal or malicious or overly aggressive. He will request that you get out of his way. But if you don't, he will take you out of his way. So he's got that refined vibe that we were talking about uh, last week, that he's sort of, well, you know, he's from a more civilized age. Let's face it. He survived Order 66 all the way through post-original trilogy era. So the guy's a major survivor. He's definitely the proxy for Joris Sabiath from the Zaun heir to the Empire. And I know a lot of people say call him Joris Saboth. Okay? But I was at a book signing for Tim Zahn and he kept talking about the Sabaoth guy. <laughs> and about the fifth or sixth time he said it, the 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 bell went off and, and the light bulb went off, you know, lit up in my head. I was like, oh, that's how he says it. Well, that's how I'm gonna say it then. You know, yeah, I, re both? I remember reading the book yeah. for the first time, and I always said in my in my head, Saboth, Saboth. Yeah, and Saboth. I think you were the mm -hmm. one that said this on the show one time many years ago about Sabaoth, and then I flipped the switch. I went I went to Sabaoth. Yeah, well, I mean, if you look at the way it's spelled, I mean, that's really what makes the most, most sense Yeah, to say it, how the vowels roll out. <laughs> but I noticed in a live show last week, some people in the chat were like, well, Jimmy Mack hit his head or something. He doesn't know how to say some both. It's like, no, I do. And I learned from the master. So shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. More details on Ray Stevenson's Balin Skull. Uh, he sounds like a great character, and he looks the yeah. part. I, I love his voice. What we've seen of him just seems perfect. So yeah. he does have a great voice. Yeah. And, uh, as, as we've heard uh, with him providing the vocals for Gar Saxon in the Rebel series. Um, but, yeah, this character, this character has a lot going on for him, I think. I think it's going to be a, a fan favorite, maybe. So, again, sad that Ray's not going to oh. be around to see this show go out there publicly and, and, and get all the accolades that yeah. he deserves for all of his hard work. It's sad. really is. Uh, I thought what we would do, because there are a number of photos that have been released across multiple channels, some Empire Magazine, uh, some the Star Wars social media channels, so I thought we could just throw them up and we'll take a look at them, flip through, see if anything yeah, is interesting. Sure. So right, these well, are I love this picture. Yeah, these are some of the this oh, is one of the so official good. photos that was released this week from a Disney Lucasfilm. So this is a Sokotano in front of some sort of uh, schematic here. A, a star a sky, chart. It's perhaps? a map. Yeah, a map, it's a, a star map. chart. It looks very similar to the map that we see 
in The Force Awakens that was missing that one little yes. part that R2 had right. in his memory. The map it looks to very Skywalker. similar to that. Yeah, yeah. Which was such a cool part of Force Awakens that they were trying mm-hmm. to find the map to Skywalker. It created just so much anticipation. Uh, R2 under the blanket, you know. I know looking back, yeah. it would have been nice to have R2 there, but then he gets reactivated because Luke is uh, perhaps on his way back or they have the ability to, 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 and there was speculation about that. Luke wanted R2 to wake up at that moment. He had planned all yeah. this out. Eh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going uh, to see The Force Awakens at uh, the the Lyric Opera House in downtown Chicago. It's going to have the the symphony playing, the, the CSO, Chicago Symphony Orchestra, playing with the film. Oh, how it's, cool. It's, being projected that's gonna be at the beginning of july uh, so I'm now jim will that. you be lending the vocals for the live rendition of jabba flow well it looks like i'm gonna be taking my mr microphone with me to the show because i wasn't considering that until now you'll be hearing me from the cheap seats <laughs> jabba flow. Oh, da, da, George. I, I forget how that's <laughs> i've heard that. We did a live. We did do a live it, version in, uh, with uh, Big Steve in and uh, the the two of us in uh, in Orlando. Yeah, it was a good time. Michael was up there. Billy Mac, I think, might have been. Was <laughs> Billy there? Maybe he wasn't, but it was hilarious. It, it was, was great. A lot of fun. So yeah, so Rosario looking great. Yep, there's some sort of map. So maybe this is going to have some shades of that. They're borrowing that that sort of missing puzzle piece as they're looking perhaps for a map to Ezra. In this case, just speculating. Right, there. That's what this is. The yeah. map to Ezra. Yeah. And all they see are, Captain, we have veils here. <laughs> Head of you, veils <laughs> here. This is a fun shot of Ahsoka uh, and Hera. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ahsoka and Hera standing there. Uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead mm-hmm. in her goggles and her bomber jacket with the fur lining. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know. I wonder if she's ever going to put those goggles over her eyes. I don't think Hera ever did. I think it was Yeah, purely, she didn't even when she was flying, did she? I think it was purely a fashion accessory. Yeah. She never wore those goggles, hmm. I'd like to say. I wonder if the lenses are if prescription. If I'm wrong, somebody send me, somebody send me a screenshot with an episode, uh, with a, a, a season and episode number, so I could confirm it myself. But I don't think she ever wears those goggles. Uh, and this looks like the inside spread of the magazine here. We've got Ahsoka. This A lot of these look like they're taking place in the same setting. You're noticing the the red yeah. trim around the, uh, the, uh, the, the buttons and the dials and the consoles. This I, I don't know like what where this is exactly, but it looks like they're on some sort of, of a ship. starship. Yeah. 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 The, with the buttons and the knobs and the dials. And it's, it looks like she's doing a combination of uh, force. Uh, I don't know if this is a, a force push, a force choke. If she's doing a Jedi mind trick at the same time, she's holding open uh, her, her lightsaber. See how the two fingers are kind of bent up like. Multitasking. These are not the droids yeah. they're looking for. Yeah. No, that's that's a great <laughs> observation. She's she's obviously up to something more than just dueling with a blade. She's yeah. she's playing mind tricks on someone or making someone uh, tap dance around or do something silly. The uh, the line here on the the caption here says, "All the Jedi had been slaughtered. Well, nearly all of them. Now, animated icon Ahsoka." is headlining her own live-action series, Welcome to the Revolution. How very Hamilton of them. Uh, okay, here's the Inquisitor. Now, I'm Jim, I have not put any time into researching what the Wikipedia types are saying about this Inquisitor, whether or not yeah. this character comes from the world of comics or novels. All I know is it's no. another Inquisitor. What do you know about this, if anything? I, I know very little, uh, except what I do know of Inquisitors is uh, 
I thought for sure that they had been largely eliminated by this point in the Star Wars timeline. Again, it's a question of why didn't we see these guys in the original trilogy? I mean, uh, the Inquisitors surely would have been active at some point during that time. So I assume that the Inquisitors was largely a, a finished program toward the end of the Empire. Yeah. Why need them when you have a Death Star? <laughs> you know what I mean? So... I wouldn't have been surprised if uh, Vader himself liquidated the uh, Inquisitor's program himself by hand Hmm. uh, once the Empire had that battle station at its disposal. Now, who is this Inquisitor? Who would he be working for? There is no Empire at this time. We know the Empire is all hidden. Um, Most of them are off in the Unknown Regions. The Shadow Council maybe has yet to be formed. Unless this is a flashback. Yeah. This could be a flashback, or this person could be coming from the same place where Balin and and Shin are coming from, which may be the world between worlds or or something, but there's some reason why these characters have all been off the radar until this time. and Or maybe it's their exploration for Ezra going into the unknown regions or messing around with the world between worlds, maybe that unleashed or unlocked wherever these guys were hanging out. And now you have mercenary Jedi and inquisitors (laughs) and all of this stuff going on. This, this setting, this uh, sort of dark forest setting that we're looking at here does remind me a little bit of the forest that she first encounters Grogu. Ah, and, yes. so she was hanging there training Grogu. I don't know if this is, you know, where she hangs, and there's some sort of history she has with this place. And like you said, this could be a flashback. But I'm starting to wonder. We were talking about this a little bit offline about these Inquisitors, and they 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 seem to be almost like placeholders for a better villain <laughs> almost it, well, like, well, so until far, we can yeah. find a, vi- a better villain, let's throw in a, an inquisitor and they, they die in consequential in consequentially a lot of times. So I don't know. I feel like they're the red shirts of the star Wars universe. They're the, they, you, you look at an inquisitor and, the, and you go, well, they're not going to survive this season. They're done. They're toast. It was sort of like that in the animated shows as well. So they just mm. seem disposable. I think that's the word. I don't look at them and go, ooh, you know, this is very threatening. I look at them and go, right. okay, you know, a couple episodes and they'll be toast. Well, and the Inquisitors have been just so poorly used, too. I mean, the the way they, they all can take a saber into the gut and survive without <laughs> any explanation. It, it does a few things. It, it It diminishes the integrity of both the characters and the lightsaber itself. I mean, if the lightsaber isn't going to kill you the second it pierces your skin, then then what are we even doing this for anymore? <laughs> you know, I mean that that's like the ultimate weapon, right? You right. Know? It, 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 yeah, you it certainly didn't uh, the- you know do Qui Gon Jinn any favors when it went into his gut. Exactly. So there's your baseline. <laughs> now you have these goofballs who are like, are they Sith? What are they? You don't even know for sure. Uh, because there's only supposed to be two Sith. So who are these characters running around with red sabers uh, impervious to other lightsabers? I, <laughs> I, I just don't understand how that works. And we need an explanation for it. We need it now. I'm tired of seeing these so-called journalists sit down with Deborah Chow and only ask her how it, how difficult it was to cast a child as the role of Leia. Let's ask some <laughs> real questions about the story. Does anybody know who wrote these Kenobi episodes? Who wrote this yeah, I, there needs to be accountability or some sort of explanation. Perhaps let me calm down. <laughs> Perhaps the inclusion of an inquisitor in the Ahsoka series will provide us with the knowledge we need to make the the, the absolute silliness of the writing of Kenobi make any sense. Specifically, those scenes where two inquisitors take sabers through the gut, presumed dead, only to return with no explanation none maybe this character will provide the explanation and just simply tell us oh yeah well inquisitors we all know the secret you know just give us something well, at least anything. with fennec shand she took a blaster to the gut and they explained how she you know she was modded out 
They explained right. it. Right. Yeah, we need some splaining. <laughs> So. I'm looking at this visor. I'm thinking uh, it's giving me ninja, even snake eyes yeah. from uh, G.I. Joe course. sort of vibes, but very, very ninja-esque. Um, yeah. Maybe this Inquisitor will bring something to the party. It seems like every one of them are, are pretty easy to uh, to uh, defeat. Um, even if they do come back from death with no explanation, they still don't seem that threatening to me. At least we haven't seen them flying around using those those dual sabers as helicopters like they were in Rebels, which was the silliest <laughs> visual of all time in Star Wars. Go, go, um, gadget copter. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know what's going on here with the Inquisitors. It seems like there's been plenty of missteps made along the way with them. Yeah. From the Grand Inquisitor to Reva, I hope this guy or girl, whoever this is, is is able to elevate the Inquisitors into some sort of uh, threat that we can actually take seriously. I mean, them, the Knights of Ren, it's the same thing. What's the purpose? Why are yeah. we dealing with these characters? Who are they? Because you know, as you I said, might they even throw said, the, uh, they, the Praetorian Guards in there up until... We saw them in Mando season three. They sure looked threatening in yeah. the sequels, but Ray and Kylo made pretty quick work of them. So there's these. Well, that's okay because they don't. They're not force users, so they're kind of disposable, right? Just well, like the that's Imperial true. Yeah, Royal yeah, Guard. you're right. You're right. Their job is primarily to stand around. They're and bodyguards, look cool. and you know that they're a step above stormtroopers, at least, right? Like the Imperial like Royal so. Guards. Right. They were that's exactly well. right. Yeah. That yeah. they just they were... stand around and look cool. Yeah. All right. So let's... uh the Inquisitors, I we need we need some more meat on this bone, the Inquisitors. Otherwise, they're the Knights of Ren and we don't know why they're there, what they're doing there, what's their purpose. Are they threatening? They don't appear to be. They look cool. But what do they do? Yeah. Why are they there? What's the purpose? This is called storytelling. Let's get together. Yeah. All right. Here is a robed Ahsoka standing in the room with Sabine. Sabine cradling her helmet. I think I feel like that's the first time we've seen her helmet uh, in shot, in view. I, it feels like this is the first time you're seeing her in the Mandalorian gear at all, live action. I think. Yeah. This is yeah. First okay. Once. So that's why this feels so new to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Looks so, very yeah, good. Is, Not as yep. obnoxious as I feared. Not as brightly colored. Which I felt was kind of jarring with the Sabine and the, uh, I mean, there's there's colors there, there's no doubt about it, but it seems a little more muted. Yes. Um, yeah, and that that and, is a and, necessary, and, you know, unless they're making uh, Dick Tracy or something, you know, where they really want it to look like a scene yeah. out of a comic book. That is a necessary thing that they have to do is to pull back on the colors a mm -hmm. bit when they make that transition from. Uh, animation to live action. Right. right. Yeah. Otherwise, it looks, well, otherwise it looks too cartoony. Super, in superhero films, they've been doing that forever, you know? I mean, yeah. compare Chris Reeves, Superman, to the Man of Steel version in the Zack Snyder film. There's there's a, a heavy muted situation going on there with Henry Cavill as opposed to Christopher uh, Reeves. Um but uh, I, I like I like what I'm seeing here from Sabine. This is uh, a very accurate depiction of the character, and she looks great. So yeah. um, I, I think they did a great job transferring the character from animation to live action. And look, she's got Indiana Jones satchel with her right there. Hey! Over her shoulder. Maybe the stones of in there. Kali are in there somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, maybe she'll pull out the Havitos idol. She'll hold yeah. it up and everybody will kneel and start <laughs> praying and they can escape. That'd be a good plan. Yeah. All right. What else we got? Oh, here's Balin Skull and Shin yep. standing. Uh, this is a great shot. This almost looks like an Annie Leibowitz kind of thing uh, you'd expect it's, to see. It does, yeah. Yeah, Side very shot. moody with the yes yeah, profile shot with the, sort of the cloudy background. But yeah, they look, they look great. Um I, I I like this idea that they could be sort of anti heroes in a sense, and that there is likely, and they they say this in that SF Gazette, they point out that perhaps uh, Skull is uh, one that's going to find redemption during the series. I think we can probably already guess that 
you know, he may come in a mercenary working for Thrawn, but likely go out as some sort of hero. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. He'll remember who he once was. Yes. Yes. And uh, oh, this is a great shot of Mary Elizabeth Winstead is, is Hera. Again, the colors. Now, she is probably the most bold, I would say, color wise, because of that green skin that she has and the contrast with the with the leather and the the goggles and all of that she probably looks to, to me the most cartoony so far and i don't mean that in a bad way i mean she just kind of looks like she just leapt off the animated cell or pixel or whatever you want to say now and jumped into live action well we've seen plenty of uh green women lately from gamora uh, Guardians uh, yeah, to right. the She-Hulk, uh, and, and now Hera joins the ranks of uh, of the great green women of cinema. Yes, pioneered and, by uh, the Orion animal woman from the original Star Trek. Yeah, of yeah. course. And I think that's uh, a Mon Cal, maybe a young one. Oh, yeah, a it young is. Mon Cal. Maybe it's like Akbar's son or something as we were introduced to him in The Rise of Skywalker. Maybe this is his first day at work. <laughs> I don't know, but she does Maybe. look great. She does look great, you know. It's and she possible. was, she was definitely a tribute to the sort of the the, the World War II era bombers. Um, you can tell by obviously her outfit and the goggles and the leather cap, and so bomber jackets becoming more fashionable amongst uh, the the rebellion. In the Mandoverse era, we saw Filoni and uh, oh yeah, Kim's Convenience, and uh, they were all wearing the bombers jackets. in the barracks there. In the yeah yeah, when they're sitting in the bar, the, the bar on the at the base. You know, somebody pointed out to me: no wonder the Empire is slowly regaining a foothold in the galaxy. It's because all the X-wing pilots are sitting around at a bar drinking all day. <laughs> Well, hey, after you fight a war for four years or whatever it is, you know, you might, right. you might be a little tired. Longer than that, some of these guys. Um, and here is Dave Filoni wearing his Pittsburgh Penguins hoodie on the set with Rosario Dawson. Wow. As if the hoodie wasn't enough, you had to also have the matching ball cap to go yeah, along with it. <laughs> Get Dave, Dave says colors. it loud and says it proud. When Indeed. it comes to his uh, Pittsburgh uh, sports teams, especially the uh, the NHL Pittsburgh team, the Pens. He's always wearing Penguin stuff, always, and yeah. always has. So I get it. I wear, t I wear team apparel quite often myself. <laughs> He's got the mask on, so you know it was, this was uh, COVID era, still dealing with the restrictions yeah. of all that. So I hope none of that is, uh, God forbid this show provides us some like subpar entertainment. They start leaning on, uh, well, you know, COVID restrictions. It's, no, no. Oh, can I, we finally that get boat past has that. sailed. Jeez. That boat has sailed. We've moved on <laughs> to write, using the writer's strike as an excuse now. So, I mean, there, there's always a current From excuse one pandemic for why to the entertainment's next. subpar. <laughs> there's, wait, what was that? So they went from one pandemic to the next. Well, I if mean, the at least strike... as far as as far as shutting things down, they both have the same sort of impact. Yeah. I hope the writer's strike will get resolved pretty soon. The last time they had one of these, it lasted about 100 days. And so I think we're about a month and a half into it. So I hope... Uh, uh, the last I, I heard was that a number of the disputes have been resolved. There's just a couple of big ones left. But they, okay, were, good, they are good. making progress. Well, that's good news. That's yeah. good news. Well, it will have no effect on this season of Ahsoka. It, it could actually affect a, a season two. But something tells me a guy like Dave Filoni, if there's going to be a season two, he's already got those scripts all fleshed out in his mind at least. You know, he knows, he knows. Or he has one of his notebooks like George had his notebook. And oh, yeah. There's a, a scribbling down of ideas. Now, if there is a writer's strike and you're a guy like Dave Filoni and, and you've lived – with a character like Ahsoka Tano for a, a decade and a half, at least almost two decades, really, when you think of it, 
because they were working on the Clone Wars for a while before it actually hit the air. I, 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 you just shut it off? I mean, you're laying in bed one night, you get this great idea, you can't scribble the idea down in the book. Yeah, are you allowed to have thoughts? Are you, are you allowed, allowed to yeah. write are in you, your head? <laughs> can you, like, if your wife is going shopping, can you add to the grocery list, you know, pick up Funyuns? Are you allowed to do that? I, no, because you're wondering. Dave Filoni or you're, uh, you're Tony Gilroy. You can't write it down. You can't write anything down. <laughs> Well, you know, Gilroy had to give up uh, being showrunner of Ahsoka or of, of Andor. Andor, he's off the set, but the show is he, still being showrun and still being filmed. I, I think they've wrapped. I also heard they wrapped the Acolyte, too. Oh, really? But I mean, yeah, but these, I heard they these, wrapped the, Acolyte, but I heard that Andor was still going. Okay, okay. But um, who knows? I wonder if that is going to present some big uh, roadblocks in the storytelling to the point of where we as fans can recognize it. Yeah. You know? Oh, well, this is obviously well, some par because Gilroy was out on the picket lines. So I, are we going to be able to notice? We know so think, much about I how believe, all the sausage is made. I believe didn't season two of Mandalorian rap right before the pandemic shut everything down. I'm talking about March of 2020. Oh, the pandemic. The okay. pandemic. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. So I'm yeah, trying to I think, think Mando, have we seen yes. yet any Star Wars that was not being filmed under uh -huh. the restrictions of the pandemic at this point? I, not man, not Mandalorian. But that would have been season two. Yeah, I believe they just got, it was either season one or season two. It was just under the wire right before shutdown. It would have been season two. Season two. It would have okay. been season two. I remember we were talking to Emily Swallow in Cleveland. And yes. I, I recall that was that was March 2020. And I recall that The Mandalorian had just wrapped. So we, we got lucky. Or was, was winding down. But that everything was, after that, season Book two of was Boba great. Fett, <laughs> season three of Mandalorian, season one of Ahsoka. All done, uh, yeah. And, and or, Kenobi. And Kenobi, yes. And Kenobi. And uh, you just get a sense when you hear some of the creatives talk and people in the industry talk that those that those restrictions were very restrictive <laughs> for yeah, the creative hard process. To work with. Very hard, hard to, work. to work with. Yeah, hard to work with. It also a lot of it uh, shrunk the the number of of. People that could be on set, the number of cast, extras, a lot of that mm -hmm. was greatly mm -hmm. affected. So the universes got small. They 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 weren't able to go out on location as much. So so much more had to be done on the vol in front of the volume, and it it really did impact uh, the productions of these shows. And so we may see an evolution as th those restrictions are lifted and they're unfettered by those kinds of things. We shall see. Yeah. We shall see. Hey there, this is Ashley Eckstein, and this is Rebel Force Radio, your source for the Force. Let's look ahead into the future a little bit with Mark Hamill on CBS Sunday Morning, uh, because it continues the conversation that we were having on the show last week that's not looking in the past, but we're looking into the future. Could we see more Luke Mark Hamill as Luke Skywalker in future Star Wars productions? Mark is out promoting this uh, comedy film that he's in right now called The Machine. Uh, I had meant to see it this week, but, uh, you know... Joe Dallas, Joliet Star Wars, Galloping <laughs> Ghost, Cubert Tournament. Yeah, things. I, yeah, had a Cubert <laughs> Tournament. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, I mean, Mark you know, Hamill and can't... Burt Kreischer in the machine, or playing mm. the machine yourself, the Cubert machine. So Mark's out there, and be and Mark is is so, such a veteran of doing all this stuff and keeping secrets and everything that he goes into the interview already knowing how he's going to deflect questions that it will be most certainly asked about his future involvement in Star Wars. Now, when he was out promoting The Last Jedi, he came up with, it's possible for any question that was asked him. But now the questions are all, will he return? And so he can't say it's possible anymore because that, that's a big tease then. Mm -hmm. He could say it's possible when we knew 
he was actually going to be in these productions. But now the future is uncertain. So him saying just simply it's possible will light up speculation from every writer, every fan, every social media account, every podcast, everything. So he can't even say that. So now he's just like putting out this front yeah, that his time with Luke Skywalker has been spent now. But he's very he, – well, we'll hear it in the, in the clip, but he's a very – uh, specific and intentional when he says, I think his story is over. Yeah. I can't imagine why he would need to come back. I don't get it. Right. But yeah, right. it's all about his opinion. <laughs> He's not going to step in the Sean Connery trap of saying never. Yeah. Because everyone knows Connery had to eat those words when he returned as Bond in a film called Never Say Never Again. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're going to hire you. We're going to let you uh, be a producer on the film. We're going to bring back your classic character. We're going to get you a fresh toupee. <laughs> but we're still going to rub your nose in the poo-poo a little bit. <laughs> By naming the film Never Say Never Again. Just a little slap, a little slap on the face for you there, Sir Sean. Uh, okay, so uh, Mark knows. He's too savvy to know that he's, he can't say, no, Luke's never coming back. And he can't say it's possible. So now he's just saying he doesn't understand why <laughs> anyone would want to see him come back as Luke. So on CBS Morning News, uh, Sunday morning, they asked him, will he return as Luke? Here's his answer. You know, I had my time, and that's, that's good. But that's enough. So even though you say you won't go back, there's always a chance that there's you could go back. Well, you never say never. I just don't exp I don't see any reason to. Let me put it that way. I mean, they have so many stories to tell. They don't need Luke anymore. Mm. Oh, yes, but we do. do. <laughs> we need Luke. We want we Luke need Skywalker. Luke. We need Luke. <laughs> yeah. What are you what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> That's all I got to say to Mark Hamill is what you talking about, Willis, because there's always going to be a need for Luke Skywalker. And as long as Mark is around, I mean, why not? You know, I mean, sure, the character died at the end of Episode 8, but we know that Star Wars storytelling jumps around in the timeline so often. What's preventing them from making a movie that tells the events of, a, of an adventure that went down 10 years before? The Force Awakens. Yeah. You know, where you start, you still have an older Luke, right? Yeah. But you notice how he's making the answers very personal. Well, I don't see why this Well, that's how it happen. all, yeah. Yeah. That's this how is how he's getting right around through. it. It's also how you know it's likely going to happen. I think oh, yeah. that as long as Mark Hamill is willing and yeah. as long as the technology is able to support it and as long as the fans want to see it, he'll keep coming back. He definitely already has scenes. They're shot in the can. <laughs> He's just waiting for the release. Yeah. It's possible. It is possible. Oh, and not to mention the fact that the Luke, although he did say, as we covered last week, Jim, that it's sort of creepy to see himself de-aged. And Harrison Ford talked about that as well in, in recent publicity for the new Indiana Jones film. But when he came back in that season, in that book of Boba Fett, uh, and well, at the end of season two of Mandalorian and then later in, in Boba Fett, those interviews, he was so happy. You could tell that his character got what he, what it, what he didn't get with the sequel trilogy and the fans were just electric to see him back that that was really in a way a more fitting end for his involvement in star Wars than what he got, or maybe not maybe not more fitting, more fulfilling, I think, for him. So it seems as though he really enjoys this part of playing Luke Skywalker. Sure he does. He and he's a geek. It. He's got to love the tech and working with the double and all of that. I mean, you see photos of him on set. He's just grinning yeah. ear to ear. Yeah. He's got that lightsaber attached to the belt yeah. once again. It's 65 it's awesome. years old. Who wouldn't want that? It's 65. 
75, whatever Mark is, it is. Mark is 71 now. He's 71. Oh, God, he was 65. Yeah, geez, 71. He looks great, by the way. I know I always say that, but sure uh, I does. think he looks better now than he did 25, 30 years ago, to tell you he the does. truth. He does. Yeah. He definitely does. Uh, you know, he's a movie star again, and I love yeah. seeing that from Mark Hamill. And, and uh, yeah, he, he will be happy talking about returning as Luke once again. But it ain't going to be while he's out promoting the machine. <laughs> and he knows that. And he knows he's not there to talk about Star Wars. So he's going to downplay and he's going to deflect any question he gets. And he answers the questions about Luke with sincerity. And always um, a lot of this CBS morning interview is, is it's really dominated by a lot of the same old questions and answers we've heard Mark Hamill give for years. He he told that Big Al story. Again, yeah, you know, I mean, right. it's, what am I supposed to call I mean, you? I, Big Al? Big Al? I've been hearing that since the 20th anniversary of Star Wars. Right. And now we're, we're, we're cruising up on the 50th. Uh, and, and Mark tells it the exact same way with the same expression on his face and everything every time. Yeah. Yeah. He's got so, a, he's got those um, stories in his back pocket, you know, just whip this oh, one out, whip yeah. that one out. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's like it's the greatest hits the same tape. Old. It's a lot of the same old, same old. I, I'd love to see Danny Bonaducci sit down and interview Mark Hamill. Now, I think that would be interesting. Bring out a lot of interesting questions. You remember that time? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can just dig that. All right. You're Luke. Dig that. Okay. <laughs> Mark Hamill. Uh, he, there was one other clip I pulled. Um, and it's another one of those questions Mark gets asked all the time, I think. But I don't ever really recall hearing him respond to it in quite this way. Uh, the, the interviewer uh, makes it known, you know, hey, you know, you're Mark Hamill. You will be forever known as Luke Skywalker. And uh, Mark responds. At this point, you could basically win a Grammy, cure cancer, and still forever you are going to be Luke Skywalker. Mm. Have you accepted that? Yeah, well, I don't care. I mean, the truth of the matter is, I never really expected to be remembered for anything. I just wanted to make a living doing what I liked. And I thought it could be worse. I could be like known as being the best actor who ever played Adolf Hitler. <laughs> now he you know, At least Luke is an admirable fellow. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And we never get sick of seeing Luke Skywalker or Mark Hamill. I hate to point this out. Uh-oh. Mark was a little wheezy. I that. heard it. I heard it. <laughs> Sometimes our far listeners might hear me doing that. I'm serious, you know. Yeah, because I, mean, yeah. I have asthma. I think Mark does too. He might. He we, might. We were yeah, both stupid enough easy. to smoke cigarettes when we yeah. were younger and everything. <laughs> and, and like I said, I'll I'll I'll, I'll tell you uh, my tips on quitting smoking if you're interested. Uh, show at rebelforceradio.com. Somebody sent me an email this week. I didn't answer it yet, but I, I promise I'll get around to it. Hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. We should always we should have that bumper of uh, the three PO. Uh, don't smoke. Oh yeah, <laughs> every time you mention Please. that. <laughs> yes, don't smoke. Yeah, don't that's a, that, smoke. Yeah, he catches R two R two with the cigarette in his little yeah his little claw. <laughs> yeah, I don't what know how R two is really getting a drag off of that thing, but who knows? I wonder if if BB eight <laughs> like around the corner him. too. Three PO like catches him. <laughs> I wonder if BB eight lit it for him. You know, he's got that little. <laughs> That little lighter, you know, all the droids smoke. You don't know this, right? Oh, they all do. There, there's actually a picture of C3PO as Anthony Daniels is taking a break during the shooting of the original Star Wars, and there's a crew member holding a cigarette up to the 3PO mouth so Anthony could take oh, a drag. Oh, there you go. I don't know if that's just a prank because I yeah. don't ever recall if, if Anthony Daniels was a smoker to begin with. Uh, it might have been just a joke, but that strikes me as a pretty outdated. clean living guy, Anthony Daniels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, especially noting how he's aged. Don't we talk yeah. about how Mark looks? But I mean, Anthony Daniels, my God, he could still fit in a three PO, <laughs> the three PO <laughs> plating, you know, right? And still pull off a convincing C three PO. That you know, he's maintained the same physique for all these years, and he, so he's obviously skipping donuts and cookies. You know, has to be, has to be. Uh, hey, we mentioned Tony Gilroy earlier, and Jim, you're bringing us 
some new interview, uh, some audio from an interview that he did with uh, Pete Hammond, the Behind the Lens show on uh, Deadline's website. I guess it's a podcast, whatever. Um, but is this is this new new stuff with Gilroy post writer strike at oh, all? Yeah. Okay. Well, no, it, they do note that this interview was conducted just prior ah, okay. to the WGA strike. Gotcha. So, yeah. I mean, people got mad. Tony was still working yeah. on uh, Andor once the strike happened. And he's like, well, I'm not writing. I already <laughs> did that part. And they're like, well, uh, optics. <laughs> yeah, optics. right. And he's a big Get out player. There and start and picketing. They- they wanted solidarity amongst guys. They, they need yes. guys like Gilroy, high-profile guys, to toe mm-hmm. the line. I get it. I get it. Believe me, I took enough grief when I was I when I said uh, you, what you I you did. You earned it. You earned it. You earned it. I earned it. I earned it. You sure did. You sure did. <laughs> because I mean, there's there are so many writers in Hollywood, and and they just they, they have they work insane amount of hours. They don't get paid what they deserve. I mean, I have friends, you know, and. Uh, and, and like I said, the yeah, the, Wendy has a friend technology that's a, that's a that's a writer out there. I, has she talked to her about the strike? Oh yeah, and she's all of that. She's yeah. been out there. She's been out on the the picket lines and everything. Yeah. And um, and and there's the thing that also is is difficult for for writers is that so many series now are just producing you know eight to twelve episodes for a, a season. So the opportunities, while it might appear that they're getting bigger for a lot of writers, sometimes they're actually shrinking. Yeah. And uh, you know, you you don't get that gig where you're working on a twenty two to twenty six episode season. Well you're and in some, and out a lot quicker. Yes. And something that and, and again, I'm not pretending to be an expert, but I I realized that I needed to be a little bit more informed. And I did some research and I found, you know, it pretty compelling. Some of the stuff that the production companies are doing with these writers rooms and how that they're using these writer, these big writer rooms or smaller writer rooms, just the writer room in general as a way to kind of skirt around uh, paying uh, what, what these guys and, and gals should, should be getting. Cause they're getting a lot of young, fresh writers out of there and putting them all together instead of, you know, maybe a, one or two veteran writers. So yeah. Mm-hmm. And still paying less. <laughs> right, right, exa- so, right, exactly. So right, it's a gig exactly. industry, and uh, it's feast or famine for a lot of these these guys. And, and they're just like us. They have mortgages. They have families. They, right. You know, all that. They have cars, all that stuff you got to pay for. So Gilroy, he's out there. He's marching the picket line. But uh, before that, he sat down uh, with Deadline, and he revealed that he did have contact with George Lucas following the release of Rogue One. So I think this is great. We get to hear uh, directly from Tony Gilroy what George Lucas uh, thought about Rogue One. George Lucas <laughs> called me after, uh, after Rogue, yeah. and I had a 45-minute conversation with him after he saw Rogue, and that's the only time I've ever spoken to him. What did he think? He loved it. He really did. He he li- he, he liked it. Yeah. He, he had some other things to say that I, you know, it's like a call from the president. By the way, that 45-minute conversation is the longest conversation George Lucas has ever had with another human being, including his own children. So when he said he talked to him for 45 minutes, I can't imagine George talking for 45 minutes. I, you know, I think when when he gets on his soapbox, I think he goes, you know? Yeah? He just goes, yeah. And he walks out of the room before anyone could ask a question. Uh, I think George does have a, a certain... A bit of, uh, art, you know, a way to articulate his thoughts and, and can probably go very deep into it. I remember mm. Seth Green saying something like that. I've, that you don't see that, that George, side of George in the public, though. Yeah. Short Seth answers. Seth said that George, you know, George was like, you know, he came off as quiet and reserved. But if you got him alone and you started asking him questions, he would go off, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's, he recommended anyone get George Lucas and start asking him a bunch of questions because we all have <laughs> access to George Lucas. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, right. He's like, if you haven't done this, said, it's great. You know, try it yourself. Ask George lots of questions. Yeah. Yeah. George is like, Oh God. Um, <laughs> You're George but, uh, Lucas. <laughs> but, but Gilroy says that George loved it. Ah. Loved it. 
Yeah. And I could see that because, you know, Rogue One really was the ILM film. It, it was, out of all the Star Wars films, that was the ILM film. And I think George appreciated the fact that uh, the legacy of his company, you know, that he established for Star Wars was still making Star Wars to that level. Yeah. And, and getting it right at the end of the day. Getting it right. Despite all of the headaches, there was a big black cloud over uh, Rogue One for sure. I think a lot of that comes from indecisiveness from up top or a, a lack of time from those up in the ivory tower at Lucasfilm running Star Wars, where I thought they, you know, they, they would just send these people off in their own direction. You make a war film about Star Wars. You make a comedy about Han Solo. <laughs> you make uh, the legacy character somehow fit into the sequel. Trail. So they had all this stuff swirling around at once. And uh, that's why I think maybe they spread themselves a little too thin at that point of, uh, the production of all these uh, Star Wars movies and shows and stuff. So, yeah. But Andor, Andor kicked ass. It was very different. Uh, but uh, Tony Gilroy tells Deadline uh, something he's pretty proud of that series, Andor. This is homegrown, and and this is all mine, and it's uh, and it's something I'm. I mean, I'm. I'm probably more proud. At the end, I'll be more proud of this than anything I've ever done. It's the most. It's the biggest. It's the most I've ever had to say, and with the best actors I've ever had and many of them and I'm getting to talk about so many important things in a really vivid exciting anxious story in a real ripping yarn I get to talk about all the things that I would that I've been accumulating my whole life long and and probably wouldn't have an opportunity to speak about because you, you can't slam things you want and so I get it, it's it's uh it's a story about revolution, and it's a story about people, normal people, being thrust into the revolution. We don't have any, you know, we don't have any Jedi, we don't have any lightsabers, right. we don't have any of that stuff. It's we don't have royal family. This is, you know, as we say, it's um, it's a show that takes place in the kitchen, not in the dining room, and it's really all to, and then to have fifteen hundred pages of original story to be able to tell about revolution and what happens to people over a five year period of time with a, with a. With a truly almost messianic character at the beginning and middle of it, who's who's going through something really extreme. Uh, that's a that's a pretty unique opportunity, and we've really poured ourselves into it. So yeah, I'm I, I'm sure I'll be as proud of this as anything. Wow, you know, and we know that it's not like Tony Gilroy is some some Star Wars super fan who just loves the idea of playing in George's sandbox, and it's like mm -hmm. playing with my action figures. You know, he doesn't come from that perspective no what he no. sees is the value of the story that he is able to tell and you know he is i think one of those rare instances where the the product is definitely aided by the fact that he's not a super fan i don't know that a super fan could necessarily tell this story with the amount of restraint that would be necessary to sort of get out of the way. I like his analogy of it being, this is a story that's told not in the dining room, dining room, but in the kitchen. And, um, yeah. So, yeah. Well, he's just a great storyteller and he has found the platform that works best for him, where he can really just dump his heart and soul into the whole thing. And it doesn't matter to him whether it's star Wars or not. He has the ability to create these situations and these characters that appeal to him as a storyteller. And then he has all the latitude that he needs to, to go anywhere with these characters because it's not so tightly connected to the big Star Wars saga that we already know, you know the Skywalker saga or whatever you want to call it. it was, this, is, uh, this is his thing. I think it's very telling that the guy who directed Dolores Claiborne, Michael Clayton, and um, the Bourne films, you know. I mean, these are films, uh, you know, especially Michael Clayton was, was nominated for a ton of uh, Academy Awards and, and all kind of awards and stuff. But yet it's, it's Andor. That's the pinnacle of this guy's career, which has already been outstanding. So... I, 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 I'm glad it's been working out for him. I, I can't wait to see season two of Andor next year. And I also uh, am excited to have 
a guy of his pedigree working in Star Wars. I kind of feel the same way about James Mangold, mm. quite honestly. Mm-hmm. I don't know if the disconnect is there between Mangold and Star Wars like it is with Tony. The magical disconnect that somehow works for works Tony for him. Gilroy. Works for him. Hey, you, you know, know what? I would love this to is... see a Tony Gilroy Bond film, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know. As a matter of fact, I'd like to see Tony Gilroy play James Bond in this. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you? Artu? Artu? Artu, you're on fire! Artu, Gitu, you found a cigarette. Well, I don't think smoking is grown up at all. Because it's very dangerous. Smoking does dreadful things to your lungs and is very bad for your heart. I know I don't have one, but humans do, and I think we should set a good example. Well done, R2. Rebel Force Radio. You've already made that Star Wars reference. Your source for the Force. Star Wars parody! <laughs> okay, Star Wars in pop culture. <laughs> Here we go. Star Wars, yeah, wrapping up another amazing episode of Rebel Force Radio with Star Wars and pop culture and the classic show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? The improv comedy show that was a network hit for 100 years, I think. <laughs> uh, we're, we're looking at season 20 here. Uh, who is this lineup in season 20, Jason? Well, we got uh, Colin Mockery. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, Aisha Tyler is the host. Well, yeah, so Drew Carey used to host, and it was a BBC thing too. Um, I don't, what do you put uh, me on the spot for? I, <laughs> I, I, you know how I am with names. I need to prepare. We have Wayne Brady. Wayne Brady. That's Ryan right. Styles, Ryan Styles. Ryan Styles. Yes. And Aisha Tyler. Those. Yeah. So uh, here's. I haven't who's watched it in quite a long time. The, this tip comes from loyal RFR listener Alexander Gates. He's always out there combing uh, television for any sort of Star Wars and pop culture moment. This time he zeroed in on whose line is it anyway. And uh, it's improv comedy. And so these these comedians are all on the spot. They don't know what exactly the topic is. Well, conceptually, they're not supposed to know what the topic is before they go on stage. It gets thrown at them, and then they have to jump into a fully fleshed-out comedic routine off the top of their heads, all working together. So here's uh, whose line is it anyway, and uh, you'll hear what the topic is. Uh, just think uh, just think if um, Wookiees were in the audience at the Jerry Springer show, and that's kind of your hint as to what's going to be going down here in this recording from whose line is it anyway. The theme of the daytime talk show is going to be Star Wars. <laughs> Colin, take it away. We're here with uh, Luke Skywalker, who's been trying to find some inner peace using the Force. How is that going for you? Well, it's, uh, it's going okay. You know, it's just that I miss my uncle and my aunt on Tatooine. What happened to them? Well, they got burnt alive. Yes. <laughs> By the Empire. And so I got a little, you know, I'm holding a little grudge against the Empire. The other thing is I just feel really alienated because I, because I don't know what my dad is. That's all right. That's all right. Maybe we can find out who that is. And I'm just wondering maybe a DNA test or something if I can just find out. I think I just find out who my father is. Well, interesting, interesting. Well, we also have here someone who wants to share the Empire's side, a Mr. Darth Vader. Darth? How are you? It's nice to be I'm here fine. today. I'm fine. How are you? <laughs> I have to say you sound much more different in person than you do. I had a little throat surgery done. Oh, did you? <laughs> Turns out I, my larynx was oversized. I All right, what do you say breathing. to charges that you are just evil and you are bringing evil into the galaxy? I've changed through meditation. Have you? Look, I've worked <laughs> a lot of things in the past, but I've mellowed out. I moved up to Coeur d'Alene. Things are just fine for me now. Oh, yes? Well... I don't know That's if we Idaho. should tell this right now, but we have taken some of your DNA, and you are, in fact, Luke Skywalker's father! Oh, oh, oh my God, you're my, oh my God, you're my father! I suppose you want to borrow the car. <laughs> Chewie, get us out of here! That's going to wrap things up for us here this week. 
on Rebel Force Radio. Thank you all so much for tuning in to the program. A lot of Ahsoka news. That's probably going to be a hallmark of our show over the next few weeks as we count down the two months and two weeks left until the premiere on August 23rd. What a good time that's going to be. I'm so looking forward to the after shows and the ability to hang out, take your calls, and just have new Star Wars to wake up to every Wednesday. That's going to be a great time. If you'd like to hang out with us, more Rebel Force Radio in your life, the best way to do that is over at Patreon. Head over to patreon.com slash Rebel Force Radio or go to the official Rebel Force Radio website. That's rebelforceradio.com and click on the Patreon banner in the right rail and you will be transported magically, magically over to Rebel Force Radio on Patreon where you can sign up at the membership level of your choosing, whatever fits your budget and there are lots of perks and benefits they're in so check it out you can also get samples of a lot of the exclusive podcasts on patreon on the website so check them out things like rfr rpg and rfr q a babu freaks samples available for some of those shows so you can get a taste taste of what's in store it's also one of the absolute greatest and best communities of star wars fans that you will find anywhere in the galaxy that's over on Patreon. Uh, we'd love to have you check out our YouTube channel. When we do go live with those after shows, we're going to do that on YouTube. You can also check out the YouTube channel. And please like, subscribe, comment on those videos. There's a ton of stuff. You can just check out the playlists to give you an idea of the content that's out there. Interviews with Star Wars celebrities throughout the years lots of live shows great bits from shows past and for the most part since we started doing these live after shows you can find all of those there so if you want to know what our thoughts were of season one episode four of the mandalorian you can go right there check it out you can watch that after show follow us on our socials facebook Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Rebel Force Radio. The official website for all things and everything RFR, rebelforceradio.com. But the best way to support the podcast now and always is to do what you're doing right now. Just listen. Listen. Spread the word. If your podcatcher of choice allows you to do so, please leave us a review. Just one simple rule. Make them good. And we will be back next week with more Rebel Force Radio. The summer has just begun. The summer of RFR. <laughs> Until next time, for Rebel Force Radio, I'm Jason. And I'm Jimmy Mack. And remember, the Force will be with you always. Rebel Force Radio? How much do I dig that title?